Hey there, birders. Welcome to part three of this three-part Identifying Warblers by Flight Call series I produced. Um, yeah, so if you've watched part ones and part two already, hopefully you have. If not, go watch them before watching this one uh, for more background and, yeah, where I set the scene. But basically, we are looking at sonograms or spectrograms of bird calls, um, specifically the flight calls of wood warblers, which uh, are given both in diurnal migration and in the early morning, um, yeah, morning flight phenomenon seen during the fall. Um, and understanding how to read the sonograms and connect them with what you're what you can see on birds flying overhead will help you uh, better nail down that ID of the uh, mysterious bird um, that without understanding the flight calls may uh, otherwise go down in your eBird report as warbler spa, especially when you're at a site, I keep referring to my, my hometown, uh, Higby Dyke in Cape May, but if you're at such a site where you're you got hundreds if not thousands of warblers going overhead on a great late september morning uh after a night of northwest winds um then flight calls will really come in handy because you're not going to be able to um get on all the birds and all the experienced uh birders including those doing the formal counts are not looking at each and every warbler going their head. Um, not, not in any detail anyway. They have a clicker in hand and they're listening to the flight calls. All right, so uh, yeah, don't wanna beat a dead horse here. So let's go on. So the first species, um, now we're getting into late fall. Actually, by the time this comes out and you've already hopefully have heard quite a few yellow rump warblers. Um, the ones we have in the east are the myrtle type. Um, yeah, as shown by this in-flight shot, which is 100% real, by the way. Um, this is where they get the nickname Butterbutt from because their rump is covered in melting butter. All right, so, but this is not visual ID, this is flight call. So first thing to note about the yellow rump warbler is they are by far the dominant species seen um, in, yeah, in North America, Eastern North America anyway, in the late fall through the winter. Um, these birds will subsist on wax myrtle or bayberry uh, through the winter while other warblers stick to their traditional insectivorous uh, nature. And uh, so they have to move south of the border, uh, most of them, or at least into Southern Florida uh, for the winter. And as before at the bottom, I've included hourly averages based on the data collected um, from the morning flight in Cape May. Um, yeah, generated by Trek Telen, where the data is inputted and inputted, input, put in. They really show up in very late September and the first week of October, really, and then peak by middle of October. At least when I'm getting this video uploaded, it'll still be before the peak time. Too. So you'll have plenty of chances to hear this bird. And so I'm starting with uh, yellow rumps. So now to get into the calls, finally, uh, there's two main calls. There's this um, call, what I'm calling the flight general flight call, which is given during nocturnal migration and also early morning. Um, so if you're at the, again, at the Higby Dyke, um, you may hear this call a lot or at the Hawk Watch, um, like the first hour, a few hours after sunrise, um, they'll be giving a mixture of calls, both this call and the next one, which is uh, purely diurnal 
flight call, um, also known as a chip note. And as you can see, they have, yeah, here on the right, you can see the spectrographs, very different shapes, very different forms. The main characteristic of the flight call is that it's not buzzy. It's very finely sibilant, um, but very small modulations, and it's rising. It's an upsweep, in other words. Um, it looks like it's very small, but it's definitely discernible when you hear it well. And has um, so instead of a buzz, it has more of a whistled quality. Let's take a listen. Let's listen to it at half speed. Yeah, so hopefully you heard that go up slightly sibilant, sweet, that call. Um, and then the chip note is shorter. So you can see, again, the X direction, X axis uh, is time. So it's much shorter along that direction and it's a quick um, up and down uh, flat chip sound. So let's just listen. Chip. Much lower, um, you didn't write that in the bullet points, but it's, you can see uh, the flight calls around six kilohertz, which is uh, again, also slightly lower pitched than other warbler calls. But the chip call is even lower. If you look here, the boldest uh, part of the call is maxing out around five kilohertz and starts at just above, yeah, 2.5 kilohertz or so. This is a classic uh, diurnal call given during flight. Let's listen at half speed now. Okay. Yeah, it's so short that even at half speed, it doesn't sound too much different, but hopefully you hear the frequency going up and down once, but uh, relatively quick. Okay. So in summary, if you're at the morning flight, you'll hear a mixture of both of these calls. Um, the diurnal flight chip note given more commonly later in the morning, and the flight call less as the day goes on. All right, so let's go on to the next species. Northern Parula, or Parula. This is another um, very common species now, or it was, uh, as you can see in the Trechtelin um, overview data from the morning flight, it peaked around September 17th. Um, on average, this is averaged over all those years. Yeah, so we're just past the peak, but still, yeah, there should be strong numbers, you know, about 10 per hour on good days um, through the first half of October. Besides the yellow rump, this will be the most common herd call, um, slightly more frequently than the black poles, probably, by the time this comes out in early October. The nice thing is this is also very distinct. It's, as you can see in these three examples, it's a high clearly descending tsiu. So it has this very straight li linear drop, meaning it doesn't drop suddenly, but gradually over about 50 milliseconds. Um, as you can see in examples one and two, it starts with a little jump very tiny jump. Um, in the third case, it kind of just smoothly, just abruptly descends. There's no initial tiny rise, but most of the call, as you'll hear in the examples, which I'll play in a second, are very, very similar, very similar length and similar slope. So let's listen. There's one, here's another, and the third one. With a little Chuck Wills Widow audio bombing in the background. So as far as warblers go, um, 
this is the main call that really is descending and sounds like this. Um, so you see it's more whistly uh, quality. The first example is slightly more sibilant. It's got some tiny modulations showing compared to two and three. A number of sparrow species give a descending call, which tend to be longer than parallel and also different frequency. But that's that's another tutorial for another day. Okay, so now we're moving on to slightly less common birds, but still species that you'll hear giving distinctive calls, a few here and there uh, in the late fall. Um, Black-throated blues start early, um, pretty early in the, as you can see from the graph below, from end of August. Uh, but up until almost the end of October, you can still see uh, a few of them. So they have a quite protracted migration uh, through Cape May, a lot like uh, black and white warbler, I want to say. But peaking in actually in October rather than September. So this is another species you'll be hearing, not in the hundreds like Perula and yellow rumps, but a few here and there. Uh, by the time this video comes out in 2023. Um, and here we have kind of the opposite of Perula in that it's not a descending call, but an abrupt rise or abrupt upsweep. Very short, um, yeah, much shorter call than the Perula. Um, and it has this little, Usually there's always, almost always a little hiccup or a stumble on the way up. Just give it, I think, like a whip-like sound because it's uh, also quite short call. And then the other note I wrote here is that, yeah, in nocturnal migration, they often give these um, in series of two or double calls with a half second spacing between them. So let's listen to the black-throated blue warbler at normal speed. Again. And play back at half speed. Actually, let's play back at a quarter speed since it's so short. You hear that? It's like a little jumble, but hopefully you clearly heard a rise. That's very short. All right. So we have, we had the Krula uh, with the downward slope and the black throated through with, and the black throated through with, black throated blue with uh, the uh, upsweep. Now we have another upsweep that you'll hear, and incidentally, it's another black-throated species. That's black-throated green, another protracted migration species like black-throated blue that can be seen from even early August um, in small numbers, but all the way to the end of October. So from beginning to the end of the count, essentially, these birds can be seen, but again, peaking in the first or second week of October. So the call seen on the upper left here is a hollow rising sound. So it's um, it's not as abrupt and yeah, it's longer and it rises less than black through to blue, right? Um, it doesn't have that little sharp modulation in it. Um, it kind of levels out towards the end, um, but it's essentially a short rise from around six to seven kilohertz. And the most similar uh, warbler flight call is that of the Tennessee, shown here on the right, which has yeah similar properties I showed on the same scale, more or less. So it's... Uh, just marginally higher pitch. All right, so let's listen to black-throated green first in normal speed. 
and at half speed. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit indistinct, but it's yeah, hopefully you can hear a little bit of a rise. And in fact, not much else. There's uh, no modulations, um, buzziness, in other words, and it's uh, yeah, whistle quality. Now, Tennessee Warbler, let's compare. So at normal speed, at the end here, it rises uh, at a greater slope. So it's like a whoop. I don't know if you can hear that, which is different from the black throated green. At slow speed, again, black throated green. Kind of levels off. Tennessee Warbler at half speed. More of a sweet sound. And that's probably why on oldbird.org, where all these audio and spectrogram examples come from, it's uh, described as a hollow rising sound rather than a sweet, which kind of uh, would em emphasize uh, a dynamic ending. This one kind of just levels out no no fancy ending for black throated green uh whereas tennessee keeps yeah accelerated rise at the very end um to get this difference of course yeah replay this section or go to oldbird.org and uh yeah listen to yourself to many examples more examples given there let's move on yeah i wanted to end on a relatively easy call that's very because it's relatively distinct um and also one that you'll hear in the late fall quite a bit at least along the mid-atlantic uh coast and this is the palm warbler going right into the spectrogram you see here with the a guide i had made that the main level part of the call is around six kilohertz yeah, and it is very flat until you get to the end where this arrow is pointing to this sudden drop. It's quite distinct, this abrupt drop at the end of an already level low call, which is a big difference from uh, Cape May Warbler, which also has a little drop at the end, but is much higher pitched and has modulations. Um, this has no modulations, very whistly, but... Um, bad impression but so let's listen to the real thing now now let's listen half speed seem okay hopefully you heard that um and then yeah, to compare it with another warbler call, there's not many that are like this. The prairie warbler has um, slightly higher pitched, similar level whistle call. Um, yeah, with a slight rise in the middle, but essentially level call. It does drop off a bit at the end, but it's not abrupt at all. And as you can tell by the lack of boldness, it's not really heard well. Whereas, yeah, this drop at the end of the palm warbler is very bold, and you clearly hear this. Um, if you hear any part of the call, you hear the ending. So prairie warbler. And as always, slow it down. Actually, in the slow, version you can hear a slight rise and drop um but it kind of trails off at the end there right rather than abrupt ending so yeah here are the the trectelin hourly averages for the morning watch uh sorry the morning flight in cape may 
And you can see clearly, though, also, the palm warbler comes in around in good numbers around the second half of September, around the same time that prairie warbler is really starting to trail off. Prairie warbler is a breeder in the mid-Atlantic, like Cape May, and so a lot of them, a lot of birds north of Cape May are still coming through in early September, but, um, and, and the local birds may stick around too, quite long i'm not sure the studies are done about that yeah if you hear this um relatively low pitch level call um in august it's probably a prairie warbler if you hear it in october um especially that towards the middle of october it's very much more likely to be palm warbler than prairie warbler Although, as you can see in the upper histogram, there's yeah, still some prairies moving through, but very few. Okay, and with that, it's time for another quiz. So, if you saw part two, as you should, uh, then you know how this works. I'm first going to play the sound, the flight call, and then give you a second, and then I'll play it at half speed and also show the spectrograph. So let's listen to mystery bird number one. Okay, now slow it down and there's the image of the spectrogram and listen together. Okay. Did you get it? It's a yellow rump warbler. If you got that, great job. All right, now let's go on to the second mystery bird. Um, first, the normal speed. And let's slow it down. This is a little bit tricky, huh? Maybe, maybe not. Mm. All right, so here's the answer. It's a black-throated blue warbler. And yeah, the only little trick there was the, I think I alluded to when I went over the species, sometimes you don't have that little uh, hump. It's just an abrupt rise without that hump. So. But if you did get it, then you're really on your way to becoming an expert fast. And uh, congratulations. As usual, I have to give my acknowledgments to oldbird.org for the sonograms and recordings, the authors of the images I've used to make it a little bit more colorful. Uh, and there's where you can find those images publicly uh, on, their, on these blogs and the count data from Trektelin. And with that, I'm concluding this tutorial series on identifying warblers through flight calls, Eastern North American warblers, that is. I realize it's a little bit of a lecture style. Um, I don't foresee myself making many of these. I'm looking forward to combining my other passions, which are traveling and languages, with birding and talk about, you know, maybe giving tips and kind of mini trip reports um, through videos and where I add in not so many details that you can find in really great trip reports about where specifically birds are, but kind of talk more generally high level about these destinations and um, what's worthwhile to see. Learning to identify birds through any sort of vocalization is like adding a new dimension to your vision. You see the natural world, the world of birds at least, through a new lens, so to speak. And hopefully this will bring you a lot of joy as it does 
everyone I know who has learned to some extent bird calls, bird flight calls or chip notes or songs. So I hope uh, the next day the winds blow from the northwest. Uh, many of you can get out there and and enjoy the spectacle of migration and hopefully identify a few warblers by their flight calls. If not, don't get too frustrated. Listen to some recordings more uh, while studying the spectrograms and try again next time. You know, each time your skill will increase slightly. Um, and with each little step, hopefully it builds a little more confidence. Just get out there, enjoy the fall, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.